of actually a class that Luis um, um, did for us for solo performance where we wanted this idea of people were like, I don't have a space where I could keep this writing going, keep this my creative juices going. We we're like, why don't we make the space available for the students who took the class to come and keep working? But then we we're like, well, we should just make it available to everybody and anybody who has an idea, who has something they're working on, who wants to read, who wants to write, and just kind of make the space, right, the big space, this office space, our library, so people could just come create, network, collaborate, um, cheese me out, whatever, right? Whatever you want to do. So that's where Apostolos came from. And then after some more discussions with Jesus and the company, we're like, well, why don't we have special guests once in a while? And then now we have Apostolos by appointment, where we invite a special guest, right? Last month was Dr. Jorge Huerta. And this day, of course, the amazing Luis Alfaro. But it's not a personal appointment, as I got like five calls. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what time can I make my appointment for? <laughs> so, yeah. It's more the idea of like, this person can be here, so come and share and shape this conversation that this artist is really interested in and that you're interested in, and let's see what happens. So that is Office Hours um, by appointment. I want to give a shout out to Cindy Marie Jenkins, who thanks to her we are streaming. We are streaming live, so if you don't want to be seen, <laughs> so she's streaming live and uh, Beyond the Blur, it's site, I believe, right? Yes, uh, uh, I have heard people want it, but it's on cityberrytakings.com right now and Facebook. Great, and she, you streamed our last um, by appointment and we have it on our page too, right, Sus? It's on the East LA Rev YouTube channel. So if you missed the, the Dr. Huerta one, you can check it out. So it's great to see so many familiar faces and some new faces that I just met, amazing. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce I don't know if you remember last time that I introduced you, but I really screwed it up. No, <laughs> no you did so, it. This time I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> About Luis Alfaro. Mr. Alfaro is a poet, playwright, activist, and educator, and was born and raised in the Pico Union District of downtown Los Angeles. His play, Edifice of Grey, recently closed at Victory Gardens in Chicago under the direction of artistic director Che Yu. Edifice of Grey premiered at the Magic Theater in San Francisco and was named the winner of the Bay Area Theater. 2010 Glickman Prize. Edipus Agre has gone on to productions in Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., Tucson, Minneapolis, and Portland. His newest play, Bruja, premiered at the Magic Theory Theater earlier this year under the direction of producing artistic director Doera Greco. His plays include Alleluia the Road, Hero, Electricidad, Breakfast, Lunch, and Dinner, Body of Faith, Straight as a Line, Black Butterfly, and solo works including Downtown and No Holds Barrio. Mr. Alfaro is a recipient of a John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, awarded to people who have demonstrated expertise and exceptional creativity in their respective fields. This year, he was awarded the 2012 Joyce Foundation Fellowship and recognized by the National Endowment for the Arts. Mr. Alfaro is featured in over 25 anthologies, has an award-winning spoken word CD downtown, and won an Emmy for his short film, Chicanismo. Mr. Alfaro spent 10 years at Center Theater Group in Los Angeles developing and producing new American plays. He is an assistant professor at the University of Southern California in the MFA Dramatic Writing Program. Luis Alfaro, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to enter here and then sit right here so I can be, so I can be streamlined. Hi, everybody. Wow. Wow. When they read it, it sounds like you just died. <laughs> uh, I, hope that's what I, I hope that's the way my, uh, my funeral goes. Hey, run in, you guys make yourself at home. It, it's fantastic to be here, partly because I think I might know almost all of you, and, uh, and that's always so, so fun and exciting. So although it's going to feel like um, the, maybe the worst thing we could do, I'd just like to quickly have us go around and just introduce ourselves and just say who you are because uh, you don't have to do your bio, but just tell us what discipline you're in because all of you are, uh, I'm, I'm here with colleagues, some people who I've known since the, the 80s. So um, why, don't we, why don't we start up here? Hi. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm Carla. Uh, I just graduated from CSUN and uh, I'm out in the <coughs> waters and I'm 
And what is your field? Theater arts. Yeah, so um, I'm happy to be here and um, kind of start digging into what I want to be doing for the rest of my life. Uh, my name is Tess and I am a And it's so sad though that unfortunately there are no Latinos in place, you know, and that's where I go to say tonight to Latinos. And that's what's really sad though. And that's something that, you know, is still in here though as she was growing up and you know, culture and, and we get into the heart and it's something that she's experiencing. So, you know, so that hopefully more more uh, place out there, you know, that has to do with the culture. No, we do, we have them. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She said it. I'm uh, Minerva. Um, I am an actor and gun for hire. I say that again and again. Anybody need me? <laughs> um, I am very fortunate to be, as Carl Luis, my friend. Um, I was in Electricidad, the original production in Tucson. Um, and I got a chance to do it at the Taper. Um, you know, I've got stuff on the other works, and I have a great idea for the road. My name is Connor uh, and Meyer and I. My name is Kevin Keaton. I'm a writer. Uh, I studied with Luis USC and my favorite writing program. And I just want to do a plug if you're interested in applied theater. My wife's theater company, Unusual Suspects, is doing a performance this Saturday. It's an applied theater. Uh, so if you want, I'll, I'll tell you about it. I'm Hermine Murcello, and I used to act. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Well, I should say that Carmine was in my favorite production of Nila Cruz's Pulitzer Prize winning play, Anna in the Tropics. And she did the national tour fabulous uh, back. So. Uh, I'm Karen Anzatidi, or Anzatidi, whatever you want to say. <laughs> I'm a writer performer, and um, I'm uh, working on my second solo show that I keep doing with Luis here at New York. It's called Happy Ladies. <laughs> And my name is Tom Sandoval, I'm an actor, and had the privilege of uh, most recently playing the role of Nino in the Um, uh, Adam Jacobo, Adam Jacobo. Um, I was an actor for, for many years. Uh, I'm currently a house manager, and I'm uh, coming back to acting as theater, which I've done for one time. Hello, my name is Diana, I'm an actor. I'm from New York, I'm from Nicaragua, via New York. I don't know that much about it, and I hear this is why I'm here. But mostly I'm very curious on how you bridge theater arts with community in Broadway. Hello, I'm Sylvia Flesh, and I'm the producer, director, actor, juggler of three non flammable objects. Um, <laughs> and recently was able to produce and direct a Edicidad at the Running Arts in March. And learning to own the um, craft. Alegra Padilla, arts administrator at 24th Street Theater, board member of the Latin Arts LA. I'm not an artist, but they just seem to be a real deal. I guess there's a reason why I know. I'm getting ready to meet you guys. And I'm here to build that work. Um, I really enjoy working with the community. We have a lot of different levels, have a lot of experience, and have the social stuff in the community. So. I can tell a little more to see what the theater has to offer, and um, we're going to also invite you guys to our 15-year anniversary, so I'll be interacting all you guys are. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Estella Garcia. I'm a physical theater performer, uh, creator, teacher, um, and connection. I help with movement for Virginia and Lickley Cool. Great. Yeah. Uh, Rodriguez, uh, Hello, my name is Gretchen Smith. I'm a visual artist, 20 years, and I'm new to LA, so I'm just out exploring the landscape. Awesome. I do a lot of cross collaboration with the other people, so looking forward to getting some good. My name is Yobi. Um, I'm a dancer. 
closet writer and uh, a pre med student. Oh, cool. <laughs> Did you say pre med? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, Emma Sandoval, I am the artistic director of Dance After the Time Jose. We are currently touring uh, my adaptation of Listening in Pina, which we call Alma Llanera, Spirit of the Plains. And it's going to be here in Sacramento, October 5th, 6th, and 7th in Folsom Lakes College. Um, and we are here because I love the topics that were listed as part of this conversation about community engagement and all that. Because hopefully before the end of the year for the campus can have its first home dance. Oh. Not a big deal for people. And how long has your company been going on? 39 years. 39 years. Oh. Right. Hi, my name is uh, Frank Sandoval. I'm not really a top here. <laughs> 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 Only maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. show called Courage and Soul and the Happy Highways on the phone. And um, I just reconnected with Jackie Bustamante, who I just asked her to join me for these important roles for um, this upcoming show. Hi, I'm Jackie Bustamante, um, actor, copywriter as well. I <laughs> produce the theater. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to give you one of the closet. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, the rebels in the back. Hi, my name is Jackie Sanchez. I'm an actor um, and interim associate community advisor. She's a student element for community college. Which college? Uh, that was college. Uh, my name is Anthony Aguilar. I'm a playwright, TV writer. Um, just recently, ECLA rep picked us up and uh, picked me up, and uh, Alex is the director, and we work on the media and metro festival. Uh, uh, hi, I'm Alejandra Cisneros. I am a journalist director. Um, I work with Reese, which is very awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, I've worked with Anthony and Billy Bradford. Uh, <laughs> uh, my name is Juan Ramirez. I'm an actor and a loyal project fan. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that counts. <laughs> Marcos. Well, hi, my name is Marcos. I'm very copy. So. <laughs> um, and I'm an actor and a journalist. And uh, thrills me back with Luis in space. I was part of his. Uh, Solo performance for Chuck here where we incubated some work and I just had the honor of directing Karen's piece at Highways where, and, and I performed my piece for the end of the queer series yes. at Highways. Uh, <laughs> people, so listen. Mm -hmm. And I brought my friend Ishii from this Hi, I'm Leslie Ishii and I'm an actor, director, writer. And glad to be here. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love how people introduce themselves because Leslie actually has an amazing local history and known you forever and has done a million pieces of theater and Monica is one of the founders, if you don't know, of Culture Clash. So there is a lot of history in the room which is extraordinary, right? And always amazing. Uh, I thought maybe, the, do you want, you want to come in? Yeah, come on in. You might as well. This is Angela and Angela, besides being a great actor, uh, Works at one of my favorite restaurants, Naked Steps. Yeah. <laughs> but you shouldn't hold that against her. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought today uh, or this evening I would uh, do a little talk, and then maybe we would engage. Um, I should say very, very simply that um, I, uh, I I always like to start by telling something very simple about myself, and it, it is for very, very pure reasons that I became an artist, which is that I wanted to change the world. So between art and theater, or art and community, or art and anything else, is that really I wanted to um, do something about the condition of my life. 
So many of you know that I was born and raised in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, really bad. In the 1970s, things in the on in a game called 18th Street. Anybody belong to those games? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so these two games, because they always were at war with each other, there was a lot of images of death, a lot of images of violence, a lot of um, struggling to get through you know, my life growing up. And um, I, art was the thing that saved my life. Uh, I've had a lot of really extraordinary experiences in coming to art, but I should say that maybe the most um, important one was that I had two parents who were farm workers from Delano, California, who uh, decided that I should have culture. They didn't want culture because they didn't really understand it. So my mother would drive me uh, on Saturdays to the music center and wait in the car while I saw a play <laughs> and at intermission I'd have to go out and take a little Coca-Cola from the bar to her and, uh, and she would park in that little like top view where the gas company is, that, that little parking there, so that was yeah. my mother's spot and, um, and so I saw everything, you know, very early on, I, I, I'm very lucky, I saw like a ton of stuff, um, also I came of age at a really interesting time in the city so um, the first piece of theater I think that had tremendous effect on me was the Inner City Cultural Center's production of a fellow, which happened in a burned out lot on Washington Boulevard. Uh, a lot that never got rebuilt after the riots, the first riots, right? So um, I'm not sure that I ever understood when I was a kid what they were saying or what they were really talking about, but the power of expression was extraordinary for me. And I think that really changed the way I saw the world. So I started writing stories, and um, I could tell you a million of them, but I won't. But I started writing stories, and my stories uh, were, quite frankly, the very first one I wrote was called True Stories in the Corner of Pico and Union. What a cliche, right? <laughs> um, but it was, uh, there were, I was trying to give voice to the experience of what it meant to grow up there. Along the way, I did something kind of crazy. Um, I didn't go to school after high school. I actually did what I, I called I joined the circus. I was very involved in the visual arts scene in downtown LA in the old days. And believe it or not, the art core of downtown used to have an art core. Then it went away, and then it came back. And now we're in its renaissance. Uh, so I, I was a visual artist. But really, I wasn't a visual artist. I was a, a, an artist who wanted to paint with images. And images were really words. So I would do a lot of installations that had words in them. And then they had recordings over them or they had me in the installation doing something. And finally, it was clear that I, what I really wanted to do was write poetry and perform it. So I started to write and perform, and I went around the country. And I did that crazy thing that I think everybody should do, which is uh, be mentored. And I believe really, really strongly in the notion of mentorship. So I was mentored, uh, and I mentor people, and it's a big part of my life. But you know, I just sort of opened for everybody. Monica and I have had a long, long history because we were around in performance art LA when it kind of started really taking off again. So Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions, Lace, Downtown, um, Highways when it first started. So a lot of spaces. So you know, you start doing it and you don't realize it, but one day I was sort of telling it and I did 16 different pieces at Highways and I did 15 different pieces at Lace. I don't know how that happened, but we just started doing them. And then there was like a, a gym in Silver Lake, and we did a bunch of stuff up there. And somehow these happenings always started to make words, performance, theater. And finally, somebody saw me in a show and said, you've got to meet this woman. She, I think she would really like you. Her name is Marie Irene Fornes. And you guys know Irene, who is you know, one of the legends of the Latino theater, but a great, great teacher. And I went and I did this amazing thing with her, which was that I walked in with all my political stuff because I had already been arrested a lot for civil disobedience. And at one point, we even did workshops to teach people how to get arrested. So that's how involved I was in all of that. I worked for the ACLU. I was a union organizer. So all of that was art making. All of that was art making. Helping people get organized was art making too, right? So um, I went in and she said this very first she said, what, do you, what kind of plays do you want to write? And I said, well, I have been arrested 16 times for civil disobedience, so I want to write political plays. And she said, ugh, 
I hate people who write political plays. <laughs> I hate political plays. Well, of course, I didn't know her, but all her plays are political plays, right? So what a liar, right? But at the time, I was sort of devastated. And she said something really amazing. She said, uh, if you want to write a play about politics, uh, I think you should stop writing plays, first of all. And you should go do politics. You should go live the politics. Go get arrested. Do whatever you want to do. And then you come back and you write a play. You can write a play about a rock, and I promise you, it will be political. Now, it sounds like a cliche now, but at the time, it was like, whoa, I could do this, I could do this. So I quit, and I started to do a lot of real politics. You know, I worked for a while with an organization called CSPIS, Community and Support of the People of El Salvador, and we would go at 3 o'clock in the morning and lay down, and somebody would paint an outline of your body, and it was the number of people that were being killed in the Civil War. So you're doing all this public art, right? Performance art, right? Performance actions. So I loved it, and it was true. I came back, and I just started to write, and I didn't uh, bring my stuff with me. I just wrote myself, right? The organic, authentic self, which whatever that is. You know, I just tried to bring that to the experience and not come with an agenda. And the agenda kind of became the story, but it was so far back here in the subconscious that what I was really trying to do was just write the authentic me, the real me. And that changed the way I just started to do work. So Irene said, you should go uh, study with a guy named Mac Wellman. Mac Wellman is this crazy guy from Brooklyn. And he said in our first class, we are going to do something crazy just to get over because you guys are very hung up on yourselves. We're either going to uh, smoke a joint together and get high and then eat, or we're going to go to a nudist colony. And uh, we were like, hmm, so I think everybody there had smoked a joint at some point. So we said, we're going to go to the nudist colony. So we went to the nudist colony. And uh, some of these playwrights, people like Alice Twan and Hung On and Bridget Carpenter and Annie Weissman, people that are real big writers now. And so we went to the nudist colony. And um, it sounds awful that I was young, and when you're young at a nudist colony, you're so hot because everybody is really old. So it's really great because you look so good, right? And um, so the thing about the nudist colony was that it, 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 uh, it erased all the bullshit, right? It got rid of everything. It got rid of all the competitiveness. We've now seen everything. And there's no reason to put on a mask with one another. So that was the beginning of forming a different kind of community. And that really taught me a lot about how I have to sort of come clean each time. So jump, jump, jump ahead. And I'm going to jump around a little bit. But jump, jump ahead. I was just in Chicago for uh, two months. And I did a play. And uh, one of the experiences for me of doing a play is that I did a big play in a big regional theater. And every night after the play, we hosted a post-play discussion every single show. So at first, it was like 20, 30 people. By the end, we had like 100, 150 people staying. And that became part of the experience, the community responding to the work, building community, right? Building ways of talking about what we do. During the day, I was going on what I called my, and Gretchen probably knows this, my two trains and a bus tour, because I would take the red lines or the pink line to a bus line. And I was going to visit nonprofit uh, social services centers in Chicago. So I saw, I visited, I think, 35 organizations. Uh, everything from gang prevention centers, teen moms, anything to do with young people, because that's really the theme of the play, right? Um, so I say that because this jump in community was another way of making community, another way of talking, another way of building, another way of bringing people into the experience, right? So that experience is really kind of hard, because in some of them I was going to jail where uh, it's a captive audience, yes, but in the wrong way, right? Because they don't really want to be there with you. But you have to sort of see the community in a lot of different ways. So the community is constantly changing, constantly transforming. Sometimes the community, as Monica and I learned early on, was we were happy to be part of the Latino community, but the Latino community wasn't all that happy to be with us. So why? Because we were both queer. So then we formed a queer community. And then that community, they weren't mm, always happy to hear the Latino stuff. So sometimes we had to move through that community too. So the community kept changing. The notion of who you go to, who you find to be your partners, is really, really extraordinary. So um, at this point in my life, those partners seem to be students, seem to be colleagues, seem to be collaborators. 
So Kevin's a good example of what I think of as a new community. How do I create mentorship? How do I pass something along? And how do we create something together? Yeah? So every step of the way, building a play for me is not about rehearsal. It is about who's going to come see this and who's going to perform it and what are we going to make out of that. So it's never just um, the audience coming in and it's never just the actors. It is that full experience. So a lot of my life is spent, I was in San Francisco this summer, a month and a half, and really, I wasn't there to do the play for a month and a half. I was there to bring the people to see the play. So the play is uh, Medea, but my version of Medea is about immigration. So I was spending a lot of time in the mission in Daly City and working with all these immigrant rights groups, right? And so I'm building a community whose story this might be, right? And then we start to learn to talk to each other, not about just community, but these start to become the partners in the making of the work. So I'm never alone in the room with just you and I. It's you and I, a director, and a community person. Because a community person becomes essential to the experience that we want to relate, that we want to convey. So Gretchen and I were talking outside about, you know, when, what happens when the community sort of, you know, cannibalizes you in some way or takes advantage of that. And a lot of what happens for me is that I am, um, I don't make a separation. I, in the early days, I remember in the early 80s when we would read, people would say, are you a gay Latino or are you a Latino gay? Right? And then, <laughs> as if you could separate your two identities. Right? And in the same way, I would say that community art, as sometimes it's thought of as folklore art, and high arts, right, whatever this notion of museum arts, right, uh, is, are really the same thing for me. The building of an excellent experience is, is I approach it the same way. The collaborators might not always have the same language. So I believe very strongly, I have a philosophical belief that says, everybody in this room can write a great poem. Conrad might not believe that. Everybody in this room can write a great novel. Everybody in this room can paint a great mural, I believe. But very few of us can do 10 of them. Because 10 requires this, right? Right? Requires the discipline and the skill and the technical craft. So I separate art always very simply. There is passion and desire, and there is uh, technique and craft. And when the two meet, alchemy happens. Passion and desire, without that, we have nothing. We have empty art, I believe. And without the technical craft, we don't have the experience, the discipline, the, the craft of making the work, if that makes sense. So I love the idea that both of these things meet. So I think of the process of making art very simply. There is conceptualization, which is the dreaming. And all of us uh, have to dream in order to do our work. There is production, the making of the work. And then there is presentation. So when I used to describe that at, when I taught at Cal Arts, for instance, it was very, very art like that. Uh, conceptualization, production, presentation, right? But I actually think it's this. Conceptualization, the opening up of the chest cavity, the literal opening up of the chest cavity, and the searching in. Then there is production, the making of the work, which is the actual trying to find the heart, right? And then there is the presentation. The actual beating, and hopefully it's beating, right? Because it's otherwise you've got a terrible journey. So this connection between our passions and our desires and our investment in our excellence as a community are the two things that matter the most to me. And how do we do those? How do we create a language? Or sometimes my collaborators have never been in a theater, right? Have never seen a theater. So I did an experience in Washington, D.C., and I'll show you some pictures. Uh, I worked at a theater called Woolly Mammoth, and they sent me off to the local Y, and I worked with 30 people, adults, seniors, who were in a literacy program learning how to read and write for the first time in their lives, 50 years or older, right? Well, right? 
And uh, I'm doing this high-minded Greek adaptation, right? So I have this speech I'm going to give first class, and it's all about the Greeks and what we learn, you know. Blah, blah. And I walk in, and this woman raises her hand, and she's trouble. You can tell she's trouble because she's got the burgundy hair, and the you know, the, like the, the nails that have a, a skyline of Washington DC. And so she says, uh, she raises her hand, and then it was my manifest. She says, "Fucking your mother, really?" And I thought, "Oh." They read Oedipus or heard Oedipus, or somebody told them the Oedipus myth, and all they know is that it's the story of a young guy who goes to bed with his mother. Right? And so I said, oh, okay, I was going to talk about destiny and fate, and I was going to talk about it from the Greek perspective. And, you know, but clearly that's not what can happen here, right? So I said, how many of you in this room feel that you brought yourself to this class to educate yourself, to learn how to read and write. How many of you feel that you did that? You willed that to happen. You made this moment happen. You created the experience that puts you in this room. Everybody's hand goes up. I go, now, how many of you feel that God put you here? You're a puppet in a play that's been written a long time ago. This is your destiny to be here. This is a story that's been already been told. You're just acting it out now. So God put you here, and all the hands go up. And I said, now you can only choose one. And they went, no, right? <laughs> destiny, fate. Destiny, fate. So much intertwined with our experience as artists. Now, we take it another level because most of us here have come from these communities, right? So people of color, artists who have really struggled with class issues, all of that stuff, all of this stuff shows up in our work. How do we bring this into our work and how do we take this to our communities? So my community now, I would say, is kind of the regional theater. But what is the regional theater? It uh, started in the 70s. It, there's a theater like in every state. That's uh, the, Our version here is Center Theater Group, Mark Taper Forum. There's uh, South Coast Plaza, right? South Coast Repertory, La Jolla Playhouse, Pasadena Playhouse, Geffen Theater. Those theaters, people invested. They buy money. They invest. They buy a subscription. They, they buy their tickets beforehand. Well, if you've ever worked at a Latino event, we hardly buy our tickets beforehand, right? We make a big, long line 10 minutes before the show starts, right? So uh, this is a very different audience, a very different audience. So uh, what am I bringing of my authentic, organic self to each of these experiences? And how do I keep Luis Alfaro from Pico Union in the mix while I'm going to do these big old plays, right? How do we bring the best of that? And what is our excellence? And how do we join the world? So here's another big part of what I believe. The only way that we can grow this, this culture, this community that we belong to, is to think of it as an organism. I, I'm, a, I'm a mushroom. Right? And I grow, and I need to grow, and I need to sprout, and I need to grow community, and it, I need to change. And part of change is that um, change takes you in the most extraordinary places, as I'm sure him at 39 years will tell you, that it ha it's about change. So I believe very clearly that art asks only one thing of you. It only asks one thing of you. It asks you to change. We are in a transformative business. And our biggest problem, I think, as a community, is that we have trouble changing. Because it's hard to let go of what we have and who we are. And I don't think we need to let go of it. I think we need to see how it joins the world. So very early on, I felt trapped in Pico Union. And then Monica probably knows that I felt trapped probably in Viva. Yeah, and then I needed to uh, go somewhere else. And then I thought, so my job as an artist is to keep changing. It's so damn hard. Because sometimes change means we have to let go of the people we're working with, right? Or I like to think that we have to keep expanding the circle and letting other people in so that we can have new experiences, so that we can have new forms grow, so that we can have new thoughts and new ideas. And we have to do something intergenerationally, right? We have to let young people be the leaders at some point. So I think the biggest problem going on in the American theater is the leadership. People are afraid to let go. Like, can you think of a young leader in a big regional theater right now? Very few. And very few in associate artistic director positions. 
because most of them now are kind of run by corporations, right? People that come out of the business sector. So it's hard to let young people have their chance at this. And how do we create the environment for that kind of possibility to happen? How do I make my work? How do I bring you into my work? How do we create something together? And how do we keep our expression? Now, there are things we want to keep. There is our culture and our history. There is tradition and dance, right? If I think about dance especially, there is such tradition and there is such specificity of movement, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't veer too much from that or you can reinvent it. But you have to remember it, right? And so maybe the next part of the journey is that I keep thinking a lot about how I keep wanting to do the new thing, but I have to understand and learn the old thing in order to do the new thing. Does that make sense? So I want to be the avant-gardist, and we are all in the avant-garde, because if we're expressing something new in the culture, and believe me, if all of us went to a regional theater, this group like this, we would be avant-garde. <laughs> we just would. I mean, they would be scared, right? <laughs> they would call the police and the immigration and everything else. But I think that um, we would be in the, we already are in the avant-garde, but if we really wanted to do that, what do we know about the traditions, right? What do we know about history? So in a way, I think I'm a little bit of a formalist because I want my students to know Ionesco. I want us to know Miller. I want us to know Tennessee Williams, right? I, I think we really need to know that stuff. We need to know Beckett, you know? And we also need to know Luis Valdez, right? We also need to know Sri Moraga. We also need to know Irene Fornes' work, Luis Santiero. You can go, and there is a tradition in our country of Latino expression. But we haven't seen it in the mainstream, right? We see Culture Clash maybe has been maybe the, one of the biggest expressives because they get into the regionals, but there are people who are essential to our community, to the growth of our community, to the work that we do, to our expression that we just should know. And maybe one day, I think one of the things we need to do is we're it's, it's, it's totally like doing this up here. But one thing we do need to do, God damn him. But one thing, <laughs> But maybe one of the things that we need to do also is just what is the history of this experience, right? Uh, if we were really to look at it, I think that there's a California kind of leadership. There's, you know, uh, I think Cherie is important if you don't know Cherie Moraga's work, right? It's really, really important that you do because she is essential to the storytelling of our of our culture and our and, and this period of, of history. And then there's Octavio Solis in the Bay Area, yeah? And then there are theaters, like San Diego Rep, right? And there are companies. And then if you go on the other side of the country, there is the other half of the world, right? <laughs> Carmine knows well, and the public theater in that world, right? And people like Nilo Cruz, like Luis Santiero, like Ana Simo, like uh, Eduardo Machado. I mean, you could just go through them. That is essential for us to, in order to create new work, we have to know what the old work was, right? We, we can reinvent the wheel, but I think we have to just keep moving the wheel forward. And how do we do that? And I think one of the ways to do it is to know where we come from. So it's really, really hard. It's a really big challenge. And I think it's really, really important for us because it's the only way we're going to move ahead. So do we join the world? And how do we join the world? So for me, it is about leading a lot. And I hate leading because I love L.A. so, so much. I love, love, love L.A. But L.A. is really, really hard. That was the other Gretchen and I had. We had an interesting conversation outside Gretchen because Chicago has transit, right? And it also has a very vibrant community. And it's kind of like this, even though it's a lot of suburbs, there's a center, right? LA doesn't have a center. LA is a series of border towns. And each border town has an amazing dynamic, dynamic um, uh, way of conducting itself. So if you go to Little Armenia, which is not really little, right? Because there are over, how many, what is it now? There's over 5 million Armenians in Glendale. I mean, isn't that amazing? Is, it, is, is that true, 5 million? I, I just think that what, what's amazing about LA is, is it possible? <laughs> so there are 5 million in California? Is it 5 million in California? So then uh, 4.9 of them are in Glendale. <laughs> 
So here's an interesting thing. We live in a we live in a city where we have the largest populations of people outside of their native countries. So that makes a kind of amazing, dynamic, extraordinary expression, right? It's not just the one artist that you can meet. It's the many artists that you can meet. And because you have that many Armenians, let's say, there are the avant-gardists, and there are the purists, and there are the people who are still in the tradition of the religion, and blah, 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 and history. And so that sort of does something to you. Historic Filipino town it has a kind of historic center, but it's really very modern, right? The Filipinos, I'd say, kind of mirror our Chicano movement in theater right now, because they're having a kind of renaissance, aren't they? There is a kind of wonderful expression. You can trace it to people like Jessica Hagedorn and people like that, in the same way that you could trace our movement to that, too. So, this is an amazing city. It's hard to access. It's hard to go to. You need a damn car. Because if you don't have a car, you just don't do it here, right? And we were talking about that Gretchen's on the bus, North Hollywood, so whoa, right? And we know what that experience is. San Francisco, it's different. You know, every city's different. But this city, because it has what it has, is the city of great possibility. It's the end of the earth, right? How many languages are spoken in Los Angeles? 94 languages. Can you believe it? 94 languages, right? There are 78 recognized languages in the Los Angeles Unified School District. That is amazing. That is amazing. That is expression. That is uh, confusion. <laughs> that is cultural collision. That is a lot of stuff, but that's also art, right? So we should be inspired by the city, and yet it's difficult to engage, especially build community. So if you're in Northridge and you want to come out and see something in Hollywood, it takes you a little bit, right? So this is what ha starts to happen is that the experiences of making art here and some people have figured it out. I mean, when I was at the Taper, we used to go up to visit uh, Universal Amphitheater a lot. Because, you know, Universal Amphitheater, the theater itself, did you know that a quarter of their programming is only Latino programming? Yeah. So I think that's really fascinating, building the experience and the event, because you want people to have dinner, you want people to do all this stuff, and you want them to come to one place, because you know once they drive away, they drive away, they don't come back, you know? And so all of this stuff really makes a big, gigantic difference in our city. How do we bring community together? How do we make this thing happen? I think what I've been doing for the last 10, 15 years around the country is trying to do something like a mentorship program. Every theater I go to, um, I have some water thing. Every theater I go to, I say to them, um, who is going to sit in the room with us, right? We all do table work when we start. Who can sit at the table? Well, it's usually the actor, the director, the dramaturg. Can we bring in the people who inspired this play? Can we bring in the, the community authority, we call them, right? Can we bring in somebody who's going to help us with the language? Can we start the experience of this with the non-professionals, who are really the professionals, right? because they're the most authentic thing in, in the room, right? Can we do that? And can we also bring in five kids? So this is something I learned just working a little bit with Greg Nava and, and the, the people that do that work, right, the film work. It's like, can for every person in the room in a film production, can you have somebody, that, the junior person that they're mentoring?